Okay. Um, so um, I will start if that's okay. Uh, I'm Mariana Verejac, and today I would like to present you with the new method um, for visualizing defects and strain uh, with high resolution that we call X-ray tachographic topography. And as Anna mentioned, I work uh, at TSAX, um, and this is where the method has been developed. And first, I would like to thank all these people uh, that have been involved in different stages of this project. Um, so yeah, you probably know many faces uh, from here. Um, so it is known that um, not only a structure of material, but also the deviation from this perfect structure would affect uh, its properties and therefore performance. Um, so strain can be defined in the simplest way as um, um, change in the volume of the sample compared to its original volume, and it can be caused by different types of defects present in the structure. Uh, so the aim of our project was to develop a new method to visualize strain in, with high resolution in 3D. Uh, but most importantly for extended samples and extended and complex strain fields. Um, so during uh, my talk, I will introduce several methods that uh, you probably know, uh, but just to remind you and to compare different advantages of this method to visualize strain, starting with X-ray topography, because here we will use the same um, uh, concept of contrast formation. Um, and then following with uh, coherent methods such as BRAC CDI and different types of BRAC tachography. And then I will introduce uh, the concepts of teletechography again and uh, a new method, tech traffic topography. Um, and this was validated on indium antimonide micropillars. And, excuse me, and we will discuss uh, a possibility of implementing tachographic topography in two different modalities, in forward and diffraction direction. And then we will discuss what uh, we observe in terms of strain fields in indium antimonide and uh, possible uh, dynamical diffraction effects present. So, um, in X-ray topography, we are sending a monochromatic beam into the sample, and then we record a topogram. And the way that the contrast is formed at the topogram is based on diffraction contrast. So in a simple, uh, in a simple case, we will have a sample with the interatomic planes uh, being almost at the Bragg condition, but not quite. And then we will have uh, all the signal transmitted and we will have really high intensity in the detector in forward direction. But then if we have uh, some defect that would bring a small uh, fraction of the volume of the crystal exactly in the Bragg condition, then some light will be diffracted and we will have a um, deep of intensity in the forward detector. And this is how the topograms are formed. And we have uh, in bright here the perfect structure, and in dark we have defects. And this is an example of a silica carbide wafer uh, topogram. Now, uh, the special resolution with uh, X-ray topography uh, can reach down to half a micron. And um, if we would like to have higher resolution, uh, there are some interesting development uh, from ESRF in full field dark field X-ray microscopy. So here they would uh, put place um, a particular grain of the crystal in the Bragg condition and then use uh, X-ray lenses to magnify this topogram um, and achieve higher resolution. Um, down to 300 nanometers for sure I've seen and uh, perhaps they can achieve better resolution. Uh, but of course, they will be always limited by uh, lens. And for hard uh, X-rays, it's quite complicated to make a nice lens. Now, if we want to go in further in resolution, we will probably use coherence. And we are probably all know uh, coherent diffraction imaging, where we're sending a monochromatic coherent X-rays into the isolated sample and we record number of rotations and far field diffraction patterns. And then by phase retrieval, we obtain the image reconstruction. 
Now, if we place uh, uh, our sample in the Bragg conditions, then the resulting reconstruction will become sensitive to strain. Uh, the drawback here is um, that we will be limited to isolated samples and if we would like to lift this limitation, we would probably go for tachography, where we scan the sample with a focused coherent beam um, in a set of overlapping position to increase the redundancy of the data. And then we will reconstruct an object with face retrieval. And in a similar way, um, while placing it in a Bragg condition, we will be sensitive to strain. There are um, developments of a 3D Bragg tachography methods, um, yeah, X-ray Bragg tachography and 3D Bragg projection tachography that already allows us visualizing strain field with high resolution. But of course, there are also some limitations of those techniques. Uh, what we would like to offer is an alternative method that would combine um, advantages from tachography such as high resolution and 3D information and uh, topography with, with its strain sensitivity and direct visualization of defects. And also the fact that um, the setup would be much more stable and robust in the topography case and one can look at really extended and complex strain fields. So we call the method tachographic topography and it features flat illumination, which is um, improving the stability of setup requirement um, significantly. Um, it of course will have strain sensitivity and ability to visualize defects and um, quite a robust reconstructions compared to some other um, Bragg methods and a possibility to look at extended samples. But before going into it, we will first, uh, I will first refresh you on teletachography. So in normal tachography, we will scan the sample. And in teletachography, instead, we will place the pinhole few millimeters after the sample and uh, scan exit wavefront. And we will reconstruct it with space retrieval at the pinhole position. And then we will back propagate it numerically to the sample position and get this nice and sharp reconstruction. Now, uh, in tachographic topography, we will use a parallel beam and we will place the crystal in Bragg condition similar to Bragg approaches. But then we will place a pinhole few millimeters after the sample and we will scan a pinhole to obtain the tachographic images. And the main advantage of this method is the fact that we are reconstructing exit wavefront after the sample. So um, we have no assumption about interaction between object illumination and illumination, and we have a constant probe. So the reconstructions are quite easy and robust, really. But what is even perhaps more important is that we can study uh, different interactions such as multiple scattering and dynamical diffraction effects because we are really looking at the exit wavefront after all interaction had been um, occurring. So um, the way we acquire the data would be we have a sample with um, that we want to place in a Bragg condition so we will use um, a focus beam configuration um, and we will locate some uh, place in the crystal where we have no um, defects and we will align the Bragg peak at the Bragg detector and perform number of rocking curves to align the Bragg peak well. And then we will switch to parallel beam configuration. And here we will rock the sample and at each angular position, we will perform a 2D tachography with a pinhole. Um, and, and this is a uh, basic idea of this method. So this is an example of one of the few setups that um, I've built at CSACS. We have here an incoming beam and the sample is located here on a rotation stage and several translation stages to find the sample. We have a Bragg detector and a forward detector. And we will need um, focusing optics that would come in and out and a pinhole for scanning uh, after. So we decided to um, use indium antimonide object. And those are the micropeelers that had been 
fibbed out from the single crystalline edge, wedge, and they were uniactually compressed um, to the beginning of a plastic deformation, as you can see here on force displacement curve, with a micro compression device prior to measurement. And uh, the, the, the reason why we thought this will be a good test sample for this method and many other strain visualization methods is because if this uh, object is thin enough, which in our case is two microns, uh, and that's, that's thin enough, um, and we compress it along a given crystallographic orientation, which in this case is 213, we should activate a single slip deformation system. And we thought, okay, this will be an easy first test object because we know exactly what is supposed to happen. Um, I'm going to show you here uh, a, an, an implementation of tachographic topography in two modalities. So the first one, as I showed previously, in forward direction. So we will scan pinhole in forward after the sample. And um, that this will offer us relatively easy reconstructions and the ability to study extended strain field. But one should keep in mind that we will be sort of limited to strong Bragg reflections because the type of contrast we have here will be a superposition of transmitted signal and then some diffracted intensity will be retracted from it. So uh, signal to noise will matter a lot if we have a weak reflection. This is something we, um, we noticed. On the other hand, we try to perform this experiment in Bragg direction. So basically, we move in pinhole here to the Bragg direction and we'll scan in Bragg. And uh, we will be here sensitive, and I will show you in a couple of minutes, to dynamical diffraction effects, which is very interesting. Uh, and of course, here we become very sensitive to the slightest deviation from perfect periodicity. Um, uh, but yeah, the interpretation of the images will become very challenging, as, as you will see in a moment. So let's uh, start with the forward direction. And this is an example of an image that we obtain. So we have, uh, we're, re we're reconstructing um, a pillar. Um, resolution based on Fourier shear correlation is, is below 30 nanometers, which could be improved. We didn't really push for resolution here, that was not an aim. But basically at the bottom of the pillar, you can see in a dark contrast uh, features appearing uh, that come from the strain field and defects present in this region. So I'm going to show you this movie, perhaps it could help. Uh, the idea is that we will first use a focused beam and we will go at the position where we expect to have no defects. So in this case, at the pedestal, of, of this uh, system. And we will perform a rocking curve so that we can uh, decide on an angular range for rocking and um, angular step. And then we will switch to parallel beam configuration and do tachography at each rocking point. And here um, we will soon start seeing a dark feature appearing at the bottom here of the sample. and as we go through uh, further away from the Bragg peak, we have the soul shifting. Um, and in addition, I just wanted to show you that we are reconstructing simultaneously a pinhole. And in this case, we use the three micrometer pinhole here. So perhaps uh, static images will be a bit easier to see. When we are very far from the Bragg peak, so this is three degrees away from the Bragg peak, we have no um, dark features inside, we have no um, um, information from strain. And as we are reaching closer to the Bragg peak, we start seeing uh, dark features appearing at the bottom half of the, um, of the sample. Uh, so perhaps you are asking yourself, or me, why don't we see anything at the top of the pillar? Because from the compression experiment, this is where you probably expect to have most deformation occurring. And um, I will show you why here. So basically, this is four rocking curves that were acquired with um, 
focus beam at four different positions uh, of the height of the pillar. And at the pedestal, we have this green rocking curve, which looks very um, elastic scene, brack peak, uh, completely expected. And then at the bottom part, this curve in black that is uh, a little shifted and widened, which is also already presenting some strain. But then at the middle and top part of the pillar, we, uh, we cannot really recover a brack peak peak as such anymore because we have a lot of diffuse scattering and we are basically out of Bragg and uh, we cannot define a Bragg peak as such. And here is also a line scan, so basically an evolution of this Bragg peak. Uh, as soon as we are reaching the half of the pillar, we start being out of Bragg, basically. Uh, we also wanted to compare our results with scanning transmission and diffraction microscopy maps. So this is a mapping transmission, we don't see much. And uh, this is the diffraction map. So we can see that this part of the crystal at this angle is in Bragg, while the rest is out of Bragg. And um, I made this dark field maps here based on the um, the pedestal position, so this kind of diffraction peak that looks very elastic and very symmetric. And then in position two and three, we already see um, a symmetry of, in the Bragg peak and a lot of diffuse scattering. And position four and six is very, uh, very broad, starting to split. And at position five, we cannot even yeah, catch a whole Bragg peak anymore. Um, also, this is a map uh, using only this region of interest, so a single position of the Bragg peak where we expect it to be uh, from the perfect crystal. And we see that this will be our area of interest, what we will study. So here we will be able to observe um, defect. And this is out of Bragg. Uh, right, so now we looked at forward direction and what we can get. And let's move to the Bragg direction. So this is an example of an amplitude reconstruction in Bragg direction. And first of all, it's an it's a interesting shape. And um, let's take a look a little closer. So while going through the Bragg peak, this is the type of uh, images that we obtain. Now we are closer to the Bragg and then we go further from Bragg, we have this, um, um, fringes of um, bright and dark contrast present everywhere, but also we have this central feature uh, that is present on all reconstructions. Uh, sorry, I go back. Uh, one thing I wanted also to mention is that we might have a slight problem here with longitudinal coherence and um, basically I was able to reconstruct those images using single mode for probe, but um, including a second incoherent mode was uh, offering much better reconstructions, just that you know. Um, okay, so when we are very close to the Bragg, uh, Bragg condition, we have this uh, sharp reconstruction that has this interesting shape, and we have something that resembles a pillar shape, and we have those fringes in the middle. While we're going out of Bragg, we start seeing this um, other fringes going all over the field of view. And basically, let's try to decode those different contributions and what they might mean. First of all, is the shape of image. Why, why the image has this shape? I I've realized that as we have in this very uh, difficult configuration, um, I've calculated the projected thicknesses along the beam path in forward direction, it looks like this. And in Bragg direction, as we have 50 degrees from the transmitted beam, in fact, the pillar, will, the pillar shape will become something like that. So this recover quite well what we observe um, in, in a Bragg direction. So if we look at this uh, more intense region, this recovers it very well. In addition, we see that the pillar is present here. It's of course shrunk in height. Uh, and we see that the top half of the pillar would be sort of sticking out, but we know that in our case, it is out of Bragg. So we don't see that. 
So we know also that the bottom part of the pillar will be present in this location. So this is exactly what we see here. Okay, now I wanted to also uh, try to explain or understand those fringes that are present as we're going further away from the Bragg peak and why they change with, um, with the Bragg angle. So they reminded us um, pendulosum effect uh, that is present in single crystals of Orion thickness based on um, dynamical diffraction effects. And I did some simulations where I used the, um, the maps of Orion thickness in indium antimonide. So there's those maps, I calculated the projected maps. And then I calculated um, the diffraction based on the pencil beam. Uh, approximation. Of course, this does not recover our situation fully because we don't have a pencil beam experiment. We have full, um, we have full beam. Uh, but already here we can see that uh, the fringes that we would expect from just uh, differences in thickness uh, within our field of view um, recover quite well the effect that we observe. And also they would change with the rocking angle and they recover, um, I mean, they, they look quite similar, let's say. So um, with that, I would like to summarize a little bit. So first of all, uh, in the forward tachographic topography, we observe defects and strain present in the bottom part of the pillar here that is probably uh, caused by compression. And uh, in the Bragg direction, we have pendulosum effect all over the place um, um, based on uh, dynamical diffraction. And then we also have um, this area within the bottom part of the pillar uh, where we see additional fringes. And, but the fact that those fringes are asymmetric is probably a um, signature of strain. But it would be really, really nice to have some modeling. Uh, to understand this better. So um, in addition, we can extend this method to 3D and we will not need to do proper 3D, but only rocking scan. But if we would like to recover uh, all components of strain field, then we will need to study several reflections. This is clear. And uh, we can make this method quantitative, but it's very important to have uh, some sample with really easy strain that we could simulate, model, and understand better what we see, because as you can see, there is a lot of different effects present. And um, well, one thing we try to do is to make direct comparison with existing methods. So for example, we had an experiment at ID1 where we tried to do Bragg CDI and like graphic topography on um, gold nano, nanoparticles, but we still, we still need to manage, we didn't manage yet to reconstruct the data. So yes, if you have ideas about an easy sample that we are capable of simulating strain field in, that I would be very interested. And in addition, um, this method can be in principle, perhaps um, used in situ. Uh, because we are not scanning the sample here uh, and we will have a more relaxed uh, requirement for the sample, um, sample surrounding. Um, and we also try to use this method on different samples. So one example, we wanted to really look at extended sample and that was a um, silica wafer and the indent in the silica wafer. So here, um, we reconstructed the really, really, really large strain fields. And this is an example of copper micropillars where we were able to see a single dislocation loops somewhere here. Or maybe not. Yes, so this, this is it. A single dislocation loop that we observe, but that the quality here is much worse than what we can currently achieve. And um, yeah, um, in, in addition, teletechography and tachographic topography kick-started more ideas 
of how to utilize this uh, place in the sample in Prague and using the decography. And um, uh, Angelo is going to talk about an interesting method um, um, studying dynamical diffraction effects in strained silica just in a few minutes. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and all people um, involved in this project. And I'm happy to hear any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana, for the nice presentation. I mean, I'm, I'm of course familiar with your work, but uh, I really like the way that you have put it for this presentation here. So I'm looking here at the chat uh, in order to see whether there are some questions. And uh, I have a question uh, now from Alexander. Hi, Alexander. So the question says, uh, why couldn't you find drag diffraction at the top of the pillar? Did you lose the crystallinity somehow? Um, yes. So discussion on crystallinity is very, I find it very difficult because um, I would say yes, the crystallinity is, is not good enough at the top part of the crystal because um, we basically, the diffuse scattering from the top part of the pillar was extending beyond our detector capabilities, even if we would shift it, etc. It was just uh, located in many, uh, in many places. So it looked like we even had domains on the top part. So one possible explanation could be that there were some cracks present on the surface and then we had really domains. So we never managed to to have a to have an adequate crack peak from the top part. It was just very very deformed. So our expectations that we will only very gently push and have only single slip deformation uh, was of course wrong because there are other experimental constraints. For example, perhaps misalignment between the the, the top part of the uh, pillar and the compression deep, or um, perhaps misalignment of a whole uh, a single crystalline wedge on the sample holder, etc., would of course violate this requirement. All right. So I think uh, I have another question from Pablo here in the chat, but I think Ian has raised his hand before. Yeah, would you like to ask a question? Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, yes. Excuse me, excuse me for not uh, showing my face. I, I'm, I'm actually on vacation and I don't have internet, so I'm using a telephone, which uh, uh, amazingly seems to work. Um, uh, th thank you for the very nice presentation. I, I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, all of these exciting pendulosing effects uh, starting to show up in, in, in the experiments. Um, you, you asked uh, for what simpler sample you could look at, and, and I, I think you probably know, know this already, but uh, you, you shouldn't even deform the pillar. You should just make a simple pillar with FIB and not touch it, and, and that, of course, would be a simpler sample. Also, indium antimonide is, is quite strong in, uh, in dynamical effects, and so you should go to gallium arsenide or silicon or something a little bit simpler, which could be close to perfect. Uh, but in terms of what to study, I would suggest look at the damage due to the FIB, because everybody wants to know what the FIB does in terms of whether it forms dislocations or whether it just degrades the surface of the, uh, of the material. I think all of those would be very interesting questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it, it, it's really valuable. I've been thinking about it. Uh, one thing is that depending on how those pillars could be produced, there are different ways we can um, basically damage because one thing is if we will see from top, but now there are very exciting methods where the pillars is rotated and we have a focus beam this way. So I'm just curious how, how, how accurately can we simulate those effects? Do, do you, do you and, have any And there are quite a few questions. 
Uh, well, uh, also there's the question of chemical etching that, that is frequently used and nobody really knows how on the sort of 10 nanometer scale, what, what level of damage chemical etching does to these uh, kind of materials. We know that the, some of the etching agents are very directional, so they would etch uh, certain facets more than others. And if you take a pillar, you would change the shape of the pillar, but you would also introduce strain due to the etching. So th those would all be interesting experiments. Thank you so much. It's, it's very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I see the hand raised from Butler also. Yes, thank you uh, for, for very nice talk. I enjoyed very much. I have one comment and one question. Concerning the forward beam, that what you see is probably also due to dynamical effect because from definition, kinematical diffraction does, uh, kinematical diffraction does not affect the transmitted beam. So everything what happens in the transmitted beam is of dynamical origin. So even if you are in the, in the forward direction, if you see some contrast, it must be, if this contrast is beyond the, abs the usual absorption, this contrast is due to multiple scattering, to my, to my opinion. Yeah, so, but uh, in this direction, no, also what is, what, what is seen actually is that there is a lack of uh, dynamical diffraction in these areas, no? Because yeah, but if it is, yes, but if the crystal were purely kinematical, then you would see nothing in, in transmitted beam. So there must be some, something dynamical happen in the transmitted beam. So this is one point. Then uh, the other question uh, concerns... Can I comment yes? on this point, uh, one thing? So interestingly, we did observe some dynamical effect in forward direction. With the focus beam, we can see it very well. Yes. So even when we are measuring the... the Normally, you have either a, a Bragg peak or, the, or yes. you can have like yes. an anti right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in case of having uh, in case of having a um, focused beam, we mm -hmm. observe this very um, yeah, yeah, yeah. well first the maxima Borman and then the minimum. Effect, this Borman is effect, very in fact, yes, yes yeah, yeah, typical yeah, dynamic yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah. But so my with question, the parallel beam, yes? we don't see this. With the uh -huh. parallel beam, we don't see this anymore. Uh -huh. Uh -huh, uh -huh. My question is, what was the extinction length? So this is the criteria if the uh, diffraction is dynamical or kinematical. So if the sump is larger than the extinction length, it must be dynamical, otherwise it's kinematic. So what was the extinction length? It depends on the wavelength and on the material, of course, but I'm not in, I don't I think know it, it by heart it's how much it is. I think it was about 4.5 microns. 4.5 just so this is just we calculated the, you know, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. And concerning the refracted beam, did you, did you consider something like Borman fan? Because then, of course, if there is a multiple refraction, then the, 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 the contrast features do not originate from one point in, in the sample, but they are affected by the Borman fan. No? Therefore, it would be better to use We've it. We've been in, thinking in, about this. But uh, we had a difficulty to simulate this effect in, yeah, in our yeah. situation. Uh, it is not yeah. easy. Just take, yeah. yeah, you must take Takagi equations no? and numerical integrated Takagi equations. So there are not many people, they know it, of course, how to integrate the Takagi equations. But can, it is can possible. Can you do that, Vakla? Can you do that? Well, I've done it many years ago, but I don't remember it anymore. <laughs> yes, I've done it in the 80s. It, you know, I am one of the very few people in this auditorium which is senior. And I remember in the 70s and maybe beginning of 80s was a big boom of dynamical theory. Every, everything, everyone calculated the uh, calculated Takagi equations and this co completely forgot. Maybe Jan uh, understands it, uh, remembers it. It seems we need to team up with some senior collaborator. A senior collaborator yes. uh, uh, who remembers <laughs> what Takagi equations are. Y yes, and con Takagi is a new thing also in the world of the FELs. Uh, and there are a lot of efforts uh, due to the effect on the temporal effects of dynamical diffraction. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And concerning this uh, uh, pendulum fringes that you showed, 
I think this is a combination of pendulasmic fringes with simple thickness fringes. This is just a kinematical origin or simple optical origin. Uh, I'm not sure if it is really pendulasmic effect, what you are seeing. This is that thickness fringes, huh? From interference, not, not interference from the shape, not interference of the intrinsic wave field, uh, the dynamical wave field in the, in the material itself. So, so from, for, that, for the shape of the pillar, you mean? Yes, exactly. Uh, the, but I don't know. Of course, it must be simulated. It must be simulated. Yes. Yeah. 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 But okay, otherwise, it you. was very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vafla. So, I mean, I should now come back uh, to Pablo because I push. I, I, I was. I put him on wait here on the chat. Uh, he has a question for you, Mariana. Do you also observe? Uh, depth of focus effects. Do you need also multi-slicing? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry. So the question of it? Pablo is if you observe depth of focus effects. So if you need, you would need multi-slicing, right? Typography like with multi-slicing in order yeah, to... Yeah, sorry, Anna. Yeah, that's what I mean. I was thinking uh -huh. about this pendulosum effect and I found it really cool and really nice presentation. So I was thinking about other thickness effects like uh, the fact that uh, when you have a really big sample and you have the depth of focus, I mean, you have to see the different planes with different propagators. So if you, when you are showing this to the image in the diffracted beam, if it was affected by that as well. So that was... Uh, Pablo, it, this is not a focus beam that is used for... It's, it's parallel beam, so... Uh... Yes, 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 but still you are looking in diffraction, you have the pinhole and you are resolving a diffraction pattern in typography. So maybe your resolution of that diffraction pattern is 30 nanometers, then it corresponds to a certain depth of focus and that it goes through your projected uh, crystal. So yes. then you will have the different uh, slices of the projected crystal on that direction. So if it would be forward experiment, if it would be in forward uh, experiment, 30 nanometer would be okay for a 10 micro, even for the pedestal, it would be okay. It's about 20, no, it's sorry, it's 10 micron only. Even the pedestal, the thickest part is only 10 micron. But in the, in the angle, what was the, the, the fraction angle? So, I mean, then you, the you have... Yeah. You mean, uh -huh, yeah. 50 degrees, so let me see what is the maximum thickness I can tell you. Oh, no, no, that. So, in, in a normal forward experiment, you could do 30 nanometer on an almost 30 micron sample at this angle. <laughs> so... I don't think that's our issue, but... Just a moment. I can tell you, so the very maximum thickness we go through will be close to 19, 19 microns. Yeah, so it's basically one over the cosine of the angle of you have, and that will mm -hmm. give you basically what is the thing that you have there. Mm -hmm. And if that is above that, maybe you have to have it, those, those effects. I don't know. I mean, I was just wondering, because it was really nice to see this pendulosum effect. But I was wondering if something else could contribute there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, so Virginie has her hand raised already for a while. <laughs> I was waiting, no problem. So thank you, Mariana, for this really cool talk. Um, I have a question, uh, very specific, and to be honest, I think I, I, I would not, I will not get an answer, but I, I keep, uh, I, I, I take the possibility to, to ask you anyway. So my question is very specific. I wanted to ask you whether uh, when you are in the Bragg geometry, so not in the forward, uh, not looking at the forward beam, but in the, for, in the Bragg geometry, did you by chance had a look, have a look at the three-dimensional speckled pattern? And uh, did you notice any specific change of uh, the speckled pattern with respect to kinematical effect? Um, well, yes, we looked at the diffraction patterns for sure. In 3D, but... yeah, in 3D. Did you, did you try to no, observe? No, no, no. So in 3D. My, my question is, is, is I, I can explain, of course, why I'm asking these questions, and I'm still interested by the answer. So if you have the chance to have a look, I would be very, very curious. Uh, we, are, we are measuring in Bright Tycho some samples which, which are a bit thick. And we are observing speckle patterns with uh, speckle uh, which are not uh, inclined the way they should be. 
Uh, they are parallel to the detector plane while they should be, uh, uh, let's say, perpendicular to the incoming beam. And we, are, we, are, we do not understand why we are observing that. And I was wondering whether it could be due to dynamical effects. So if by chance you, you could have a look at your three-dimensional speckle pattern, really in 3D, huh? not in 2D, I, I would be very grateful if you could let me know uh, how they look in 3D. Yeah, we didn't uh, have a look at the in 3D for sure. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yes, it's painful. But uh, yeah, I mean, if if you if you if you are if you have a bit of time uh, to to waste on these questions, I would be very very grateful if you could let me know. Sure, we, we should uh, we should discuss this uh, some other time together. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, I see here also a comment from Alexander. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't see this before because it has to do with the previous discussion. Uh, Backlap is right, in kinematical approximation, direct beam is considered to be constant, maybe attenuated. So everything you see is due to dynamical effects. So I'm sorry for not saying this earlier, Alexander, but I think, I mean, this has been discussed already, so. Um, okay, then uh, is Bakla having his hand? Uh, may I have speaking? another yeah. question to maybe to, to Virginie, hi Virginie, or to Dina or, or to Anna? Hi. Uh, how is it with the phase retrieval in dynamical theory? In kinematical theory, the, the amplitude is Fourier transformation of electron density, which is not true in dynamical theory. Is there any chance to, to make phase retrieval to get the electron density in the case of dynamical refraction or how to do it? So the, the, the way I see it, I think it's very close to what uh, Mariana and uh, Anna are doing. Uh, I, I would retrieve the field because the field is a field, right? Uh, yes. So there is no problem with that. And then you need to solve the inverse problem, yes. uh, taking into account dynamical theory. But first, I would just retrieve the field, the field, mm -hmm. the phase and amplitude, mm -hmm. and then introduce the, the, the secondary effect of dynamical theory. But to be honest, I didn't... Uh, tackle this, this, this point so far. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there is no easy way how to make the inversion problem from the field electron. From, from, from scratch, including everything? No, and I, I don't see really the... I don't see really the interest, uh, except mm -hmm. that you gain time, but uh, you, you know, if you can get the first, the, the phase field, the complex, uh, the complete phase field, Mm -hmm. uh, then for, for almost no, no price, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, right now I would, I would, this is the way I would uh, tackle the problem, but m maybe I'm missing the point. Mm -hmm. But uh, you are right that always you can switch off the dynamical effect uh, using uh, a weak beam or using, yeah, change the wavelength that everything is kinematic or you go away from the breakpoint, then you are more or less kinematic, yes. So to add uh, something to this comment, I think that the, the way the, this problem is tackled now is, is to uh, retrieve the field after the interaction, uh, as Virginie said. Yes, and exactly. Here, and then is is a is model approach again. So there mm -hmm. is no, I am not aware of any inversion, but I know that a few. I think in optics they are doing it. Huh? In optics they are they are inverting the the the, the field taking. It, I mean the field, the complex valued field, they start from this and then they retrieve the sample uh, geometry or whatever refractive index and so on by solving the dynamical problem. Mm -hmm. But they start from the complex valued uh, field. I have also seen some very interesting uh, black uh, typography in 2D, I think. I think I saw that presented in this uh, TMS uh, um, session that we organized uh, in March, where they do incorporate in their iterations also some dynamical uh, diffraction model in a very thin crystal, right? So obviously it must be some situation where this is easy to do. And so, but I am not familiar at all how how this works in the reconstruction.
It would probably be worth inviting Tao Zhou from the nanoprobe to give a talk. He's done a, at, at Argonne, he's done a ton of like automatic differentiation uh, work with uh, dynamical diffraction as the forward model and he's using it to solve the, you know, the inverse problem. Exactly, that was interesting. Yeah, I think that's what you saw. Yeah. Exactly, but this was like a very thin crystal, right? With yeah, he's been he's been continuing to develop it and and trying to you know go to bigger samples and mm -hmm. and, and it seems to be working. Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think we had a, an interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Mariana. I think you even had the some of your points that you addressed for discussion, some very good comments as well. Mm -hmm. So this is really- Anna, would you like to still bring out, uh, bring up longitudinal coherence and pinhole story? Uh, yeah, we're a little bit worried, but you mentioned that already, right? We're a little bit worried about partial uh, coherence effects. And we have been trying to do a little bit of geometry to see how this affects uh, our, Problem. So Mariana has a couple of slides here to show us this. I think Stephen should be quite familiar with this because this is from a very old paper from him. So basically we're talking about here different optical path length differences between scatterers from points like A and C, right? Which in BRAC geometry, they become quite large. And this basically depends on the height of the sample and on the direction of the of the Bragg planes or the, of the diffraction plane. So in the case of the Indiman Dimonite pillar, because we have a very long pillar, right, this uh, difference between the top and the bottom beams becomes huge, certainly much larger than the 1.5 micron coherence level that we have in our experiment. But what we were thinking is that perhaps because we have done pinhole over there, one does not need a fully coherent uh, wavefront. So, so to, to speak, it's important the coherence only within the size of the pinhole. And then this is, because this is two microns, then this becomes really on the order of our coherence level, perhaps. Our That's problems are not so severe yeah. because of that. But, uh, I don't know if any of you has any insight regarding this. It kind of makes sense, right? That you only need coherence across the pinhole. You think so? But, well, it has to be a, it has to be a little bigger than, maybe it has to be twice the size of the pinhole because you, you kind of need there to be some kind of phase relationship between two positions of the pinhole, right? between the beams at two positions. Of the yes, perhaps twice, yeah, I see. I see your point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us uh, in the group, we have discussed this a little bit. It's a little, we struggle a little bit with the fact of reconstructing a phase over a very extended area. So teletypography can, can reconstruct areas of 20 microns or more. Uh -huh. And how can you speak of a phase when you don't have coherence? Well, it's, it's, can, it's I can it's, make some comments on that as well. Sorry, can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit distant from the conversation, but I am following it. Um, we found some quite interesting... Um, improvements of the of the visibility of speckles that we get in very asymmetric geometries like this and we don't fully understand them but Mark Sutton had something to say about them which was that there's a coupling between the spatial coherence and the longitudinal coherence which sometimes works in your favor so quite often you get uh, better visibility of, of uh, diffraction um, uh, than, than you expect by this uh, uh, argument. Okay. So that, that could be it, right? That is a, we can relax this condition a little bit, perhaps. Yeah. And, and it's all in his big paper, which is that book chapter. Uh, but it's quite a bit of heavy reading if, um, if you would mm -hmm. like to, to follow it through. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, in that case, I think we have had a very nice discussion. So thank you very much, Mariana, for the great presentation. And I will give this back to, to Dina so that she can introduce her. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is Angel. And um, Angel has done uh, his PhD in the University of Oviedo, and then he had a, an exciting experience at Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source, where he got in touch with the um, dynamical diffraction. So I used to joke with him that he is one of the few people who understand dynamical diffraction. So Vaslav, you're in a good company today. <laughs> Um, uh, so, um, Hankel um, came to Max4 uh, and uh, as a postdoc, and we started together this project. Uh, he had already been interested in um, um, optics for uh, XFEL uh, with a project with uh, Bill Pedrini at the Swiss Fell project. So, he brought this interest at Nanomax. And, um, and then we went ahead with the measurement using telepycography. So, Angel, um, yeah, please show us the results of this uh, research. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Dina, for the presentation and also for the opportunity uh, to uh, talk. Uh, I really need to see that you are listening to me. I don't know if my microphone is on. Yes, okay, perfect, sorry. Uh, so yeah, uh, and I would like to uh, actually show a little bit of a studies uh, that they do a dynamical diffraction or a diffraction of X-ray by thin perfect crystals, no? Uh, so first of all, I would like to introduce uh, one guy that we are not talking usually about, but this is uh, Francesco Maria Grimaldi. That was the first person ever talking about diffraction. He also uh, introduced for first time the idea of uh, light to be a wave comparing it to water. Uh, that was in the uh, 17th century. And actually, uh, if we see what he said in his book, or he wrote in his book, uh, he said that the light propagates or scatter not only uh, directly by refraction or by air reflection, but also by a fourth wave, the diffraction. Uh, with that is uh, to say that uh, scattering and diffraction is not the same, and uh, scattering, is, uh, scattering englobes many other uh, effects. No, diffraction is something particular. Uh, and the word diffraction, actually, this is interesting, is coming from uh, the word uh, Latin diffracta, uh, diffringere, to break into pieces. Uh, with this, I jump uh, 500 years uh, almost uh, into the future. Uh, and uh, we are in the world where we are actually in the new uh, high coherence spatial sources uh, with uh, higher repetition rates. No? So we have uh, the two facilities where I have uh, worked in the last years, uh, Max4 and Exfel, uh, or European Exfel, uh, where we have uh, this kind of world where we are meeting uh, the high coherence crystals with the high coherence spatial sources and with the case of Exfelus and self sealing also uh, high uh, longitudinal coherence sources in the world of FELs. But everything in the case of uh, this project started actually in another project in a, a small bunker in the middle of a forest next to the German border uh, at the Polzer Institute called uh, Swissfeld, uh, where I was actually uh, 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 invited to do a postdoc in self sitting uh, with the idea of improving the uh, uh, the uh, uh, longitudinal coherence of the uh, sasse pulses uh, to have an increase of the brilliance, establishing of the uh, central wavelength, and also the smoothing of the temporal uh, pulse shape. Uh, the idea is easy. Instead of having just one section of ondulators producing the sasse pulse, uh, what you can do actually is uh, try to use a, a deviate the electrons through a chicane and monochromatize your first sasse pulse to generate a seed that after is recombined with the electrons to lace in a second set of ondulators. Uh, the main proposed one was the one given by Gianluca Geloni, that is uh, the forward diffraction. Uh, these are actually works that we have been doing in the last uh, weeks. Uh, in this case, we see the uh, self sitting in SASE 2, that is actually, uh, here we have the SASE, that is around 30 Bs, and we can see that we have really a wonderful 1 EB uh, width, uh, bandwidth, 
pulse coming at the end of SASE2. Uh, and actually, even yesterday, uh, we brought uh, the first uh, time thousand uh, pulses to our spectrometer, and actually, we saw this kind of fancy angel appearing uh, in the spectrometer as SASE2. Uh, with that, I would like to go back to diffraction. No? We, we are used to this uh, definition in our uh, textbooks about diffraction. No? Uh, we have an incoming a K a vector, so an incoming wave with a K vector, that when uh, we are uh, um, set to diffraction condition, uh, what we have is a diffraction beam going in the direction uh, defined by the two theta angle uh, as the equation of Bragg. Uh, but also we have like a forward beam that is supposed to be just the transmitted beam, uh, so whatever it was, not diffracted. The same happened in the case of Laue diffraction, no? or this is what we think. But this is actually not true. Uh, what we actually have is something that looks much more like this. We have, uh, oh, this goes too fast. We have an area that is uh, generated waves that are traveling and it's like a labyrinth of waves of photons traveling together and they are like matching uh, themselves. And when they have a proper phase, they are matching and uh, generating different beams that are a uh, delay in time and also displaced in, uh, in the transverse uh, direction uh, to diffraction. Uh, and we also have that the same in the uh, uh, diffraction direction for both the Bragg geometry and the Laue geometry. Uh, we can see if we go to a pulse, uh, so a focus beam, uh, how they look a little bit more. We can see how here is the main effect of the uh, uh, incoming uh, surface. Uh, well, we have a huge effect of absorption and then we have a second beam that is coming actually from the uh, back uh, diffraction uh, of the back uh, surface or rear surface. Uh, and we have the same or similar uh, in the case of the forward, where we have also like a, a increase of the absorption, but these beams are all monochromatic in between each other, like this guy, as much monochromatic. And in the case of Laue, we have actually something really nice that we are uh, exciting the both surface of diffraction. And actually what we have is a much more symmetric signal where we have the same intensity in both sides of the signal. If we go to thicker crystal, then we go to the approximation to the Borman effect, where we will have here only like one big peak, and also it will appear uh, a big peak located somewhere here, while the rest will be highly, uh, really strongly absorbed by the crystal. Uh, so if I continue, these are some simulations I did with the code that I developed at Swissfeld. In the case of uh, a thin crystal, 50 microns, at 9.4 kilo volts for the diamond for zero zero reflection. And we observe that. You know, we observe in the black direction a huge peak. And then we observe these uh, simulated uh, uh, echoes uh, that because they are displaced and delayed in time. So they are similar in a similar to what is the sound waves. Um, and what we see is the uh, back uh, or rear uh, surface diffracting back in the direction. Uh, and also we have the same in the forward direction, no? where we have also like the effects of the different surfaces appearing uh, in between the different uh, dynamical diffraction uh, beam that are propagating parallel to each other. Uh, in the lower uh, direction, we have the same, but actually because we are exciting uh, the crystal uh, equally in all the areas, we have actually a signal that looks much more symmetric to, to each. Uh, in this area, when we go to the uh, thicker crystals, as I already said, is where we are going to have the Borman effect appearing. Uh, in the forward direction, we still have the symmetry, but we can see a be much bigger effect of the absorption. Sorry, again. So if we translate that to time, that is actually what I'm really interested in, uh, we can see that actually the uh, transverse displacement uh, as equation that was introduced by Swissco and Lindbergh uh, is related to the, the temporal delay multiplied by the speed of light and the cotangent of the uh, diffraction angle or black angle. Uh, and what we can see is the same, no? We see that we have pulses in this case that are like, uh, like 50 femtoseconds from each other, and we have effect of the back surface. Uh, and in the case of the Laue case, uh, we have some more evenly distributed intensities. Uh, and again, uh, this 250, that it will be the equivalent of the beam or the time that the beam needs to travel along uh, the full uh, crystal. Um, 
if I uh, continue, uh, then we, oh, too much. Uh, uh, we went or we tried to do several experiments of this. This is quite complex to do. So we actually fail in three experiments, uh, two of them done at CES, uh, one of them done at material science, also at the Swiss light source. And in the fourth, not the third, but the fourth, uh, was the right one. And in this case, we were able to observe the uh, echoes of a, a diamond, a single crystal, uh, that was located somewhere in between the focus uh, of the KBs and the detector node. So the, in this case, what we are trying to do is uh, defeat divergence by focusing to a jack screen and with it be able uh, like to not have the um, um, can only like record amplitude. Uh, if we look at uh, these kind of uh, studies, they depend a lot of uh, the energy resolution. Our rotation stage was not uh, as good as uh, we require to be able to record the 400 of the diamonds. Or, uh, and then what we will decide is to use energy scans. We were scanning with a monochromator that it was a high resolution, it's 311, it's not the highest, but it's higher than a 111, that it was actually the same bandwidth that we were using uh, or we wanted to start our crystals. No? If uh, I continue, then we can see the first results uh, for the Bragg uh, direction. We see that when we are far away from the Bragg condition or diffraction condition, uh, we uh, don't have the um, any sign of the echoes. And when we're closer, we start to see this oscillation that actually when we are in the diffraction condition, we can see in the logarithmic scale how nice they look like. For our simulations that with the code that I, I talked about before, uh, we can see also uh, the same effect. And um, if we compare the position of the uh, experiment uh, maxima and the position of the uh, simulations, they match as they do also the uh, intensities. And uh, we have to say that also, uh, maybe they, uh, even if we were using a focus beam that it was one micron, our jack and our optics were not allowing us to have that resolution. So that is something uh, to try to improve. No? And then uh, we can also see what happened in the lower that is the same, but uh, the interesting thing is the same. No? We really have this kind of symmetric effect of the lower that is uh, quite uh, gorgeous from my point of view. So the excitation of the two um, uh, uh, surfaces of diffraction. Uh, to remember that this, everything, all the study is done in forward diffraction. Uh, as we were interested in the implementation for the self seedings. Um, in the case of uh, the energy comparison, we have that both the simulated and the experimental data, they match to each other. So now uh, uh, we have the position of the simulation and the experiments that they also match, it's more or less one, so we are happy and we publish it. Uh, but we saw this other information that is actually interesting. What happens when we have a strain crystal and what will happen when we have a perfect crystal? So if you see in the strain crystal, as I saw, we have a perfect uh, um, uh, fitting to the simulations, as well the theory. But actually in a strain crystal, what we can see is that the position of these echoes are much more extended and even they appear to be like extremely far away. And we can see that, for example, the seventh uh, maxima is 34 uh, uh, microns away while we were expecting to be 20 microns away. Uh, with that, what we can improve to try to uh, get into uh, collecting the data correctly or uh, to get better resolution. So problems that we have, it was the big size of the beam, five microns in the uh, in a, at our samples, the high divergence of the beam uh, that is uh, uh, somehow overlapping in the case that we are not on the focus. So that means that we can never bring the sample to the focus because uh, the detectors will be on the focus. Uh, we have also a broadening due to the jack and the pixel set is, the effective pixel size is around 650 nanometers. So what is the solution? Ty teletychography, used as a virtual detector. So the idea is that we are using the big hole as the real uh, detection plane. 
and we are actually doing the collection of the data and a detector that is located farther, uh, uh, four meters away from our sample. Uh, with this, we are actually like uh, cutting the intensity of the echoes and re scattering or diffracting from the pinhole uh, to the position. As Mariana presented, the idea that we want is that after when we reconstruct the tychography uh, in our pinhole, we can propagate it back to the focus and with it we win uh, in resolution because our transmitted beam, a beam that is not being diffracted, uh, that has a different case set that is not uh, in the condition of diffraction, uh, that will be as small as 100 nanometers, that is the uh, uh, beam size of uh, Nanomax. Uh, and we also increase our pixel size to 30 nanometers and we have a resolution of around 50 uh, uh, nanometers. Uh, with that, this is more or less more how it's looking, the geometry that we were doing. We were using the sample that it was located in the center of rotation of uh, our goniometer, and then we were having the pinhole located uh, as close as possible between 3.5 and 4.5 uh, millimeters. Uh, we were having a detector to set the diffraction condition uh, and maximize uh, the location of our crystal. Uh, with respect to the diffraction. And then we were having the Merlin four meters apart, uh, uh, going uh, with a helium tube to try to minimize the uh, air scattering. Uh, what we have is that in this case, what we are wanted to do is to actually scan the pinhole uh, to have the overlapping as uh, oversampling that it was what uh, Mariana presented just before. Uh, we did the first uh, study. We go to a sample that we know, that is a, a usual sample of a, a Nanomax, and we do just the normal teletychography experiment uh, using the focus beam. In this case, what we can see is that we have put the sample 200 uh, microns in front of the focus. This is how it's looking the uh, focus beam. We can see some effects of the CMN star, and this is how it's looking uh, the wave front in the pinhole reconstructed. And this is our pinhole reconstructed. We have some kind of effects of phase that can be because the pinhole is not as perfectly uh, cut, but also maybe because of dust or things because the pinhole has been for many years around CSAX. Uh, use. So yeah, if we just look to the sample and we look to the scanning X-ray transmission microscope, we get this out and in a diffraction condition. And as we see, we already have a little bit better resolution than what we collected at uh, microxas. Um, it's important to say, it's really complex experiment. Everything was too close. The KB uh, mirrors was here. Here we were having a microscope to locate the samples in the focus uh, of the KBs, and we were having the pinhole, you see, like three to four uh, millimeters uh, in the back. That means that actually these motors were uh, full, uh, fully shadowing our uh, diffractometer. Uh, yeah, our detector in the diffraction uh, condition that was located in the robot. Uh, if we do the tychographic reconstructions, uh, we find this out and in diffraction. And actually we, uh, we can see that if we propagate it uh, into uh, the uh, uh, focus plane, we can see the nice uh, shape of the focus of Nanomax. And also uh, we can have a high resolution of our echoes. Uh, that uh, if we look to the simulations that are we able to do with the code I developed at Swissfeld, we can see that actually in a, a projection of both signals, they match really good one to uh, the other. So that is like the best uh, comparison I have been able to see ever of this. Uh, the important is that also with this uh, technique, we are able to actually see how the echoes are propagated. And we can see that they are parallel to each other and actually they are not getting all the divergence of the uh, transmitted beam or the incoming beam, but just of the uh, photons that are actually in diffraction condition. Um, here is a presentation of how it's looking the phase together with the amplitude. As you see, it's quite complex, uh, probably also because we have some kind of convolution between uh, the echoes uh, phase together with the KB uh, phase, no? So the um, changes in the wavefront of the phase due to the KB. So this makes quite complex to subtract information in the temporal domain from the phase of the echoes. Uh, if we look now to a sample that it was indebted by the group of Magnus Coriander at Chalmers University of Technology, uh, what we can see is actually when we are far away from the strain uh, area, 
that it was, uh, yeah. Uh, we have actually uh, some uh, uh, diffraction or forward diffraction that is looking similar uh, to uh, what we were having in the strain free. Uh, if we look to the uh, two indents, uh, 25 uh, millinewtons and 75 millinewtons, what we can see is actually that the uh, echoes, uh, they look to uh, generate a different uh, positions uh, and, and they look like to divide. And in the case of the 75, no, uh, we see that the, uh, th there are clearly like many small peaks that are actually generating or related to the strain. Uh, if we look to this in the um, propagation, we can actually see that all these beams look to be also like parallel to each other uh, as we were expecting by the echoes, no? Uh, or by the theory. Uh, if we try to simulate this using the Takabe uh, Takabe Copan equations, and uh, uh, we introduce some kind of uh, exponential inverse exponential strain on onto them, uh, we can actually get into some results that they match quite good but not perfect uh, our uh, experience. No, uh, but uh, actually this can even be translated to the world of time because our simulations take into account the time domain uh, and see how it will be the delay of the echoes due to the strain. And then we can see that actually in the strain sample, uh, that is this one, so this guy is this guy, this guy is this guy, that guy is that guy, and here we have the strain free. Uh, we can see that even one millimeter away uh, from uh, our um, uh, strain area, we may have a little bit of uh, uh, changes in our lattices uh, defined by these indentations. Uh, we also see how uh, when we are in a high uh, strain area, uh, what we are doing is like somehow compressing our uh, echoes and we have much more uh, echoes uh, in the same uh, eight microns that we are uh, looking here. And we can also see how in the case of the extremely, uh, sorry, in the extremely uh, uh, strain sample, we see much more beans that uh, are appearing uh, in these different uh, positions. So that is quite interesting because can tell us that we can also use this uh, strain control to improve uh, possible optics for our uh, free electron lasers. But you will say, okay, diamond and silicon, uh, who, uh, how does this help us apart from optics? Uh, what about real thin crystals? Uh, okay, so then let's try to introduce the, a little bit more of FEL science, and we are going to do a, a micro focus or sorry, nano focus being as the one that we will could have at MID. So we have a hundred uh, by hundred nanometers, and we have a SASE pulse. Uh, that is 10 femtoseconds uh, long. Uh, and what we can do is go to a, a gold a 111 reflection at 9 kilo electrovolts, and we can see what we observe. No, we can see that actually the beam is looking already split when we have 500 nanometers. So that means that if we have a really thin crystal of gold, the thin is 500 nanometers, we already may see effects of dynamical diffraction. You will say may not because it's a strain and it's not perfect, but it may. Uh, and actually the Indian antimonide is showing that even uh, the case of Mariana shows that these things may be real. Uh, when we have one micron, uh, we can see clearly two uh, spots uh, in the projection also that we have here down. And in the case of 500 microns, we have like this kind of nice butterfly, butterfly shape uh, where when we have 10 uh, microns, we already see here appearing a high intense peak and the absorption of the uh, surface to be higher. And here is where it's going to increase what I will call the Borman center or Borman peak. Uh, in the case of the forward direction, here is actually also what Borman observed in the forward direction that it will be also in the center. And we see that the absorption in the surface happen while here we don't have this high absorption. So we have to go to a little bit thicker samples like maybe 20 uh, microns to really see that this is completely absorbed and we still have the maxima in the center of the uh, crystal to say. Uh, um, uh, we can really see in the forward direction how uh, with 50 uh, nano 500 nanometers, we can really see the effects of dynamical diffraction on them. Uh, 
energy. So these echoes, they also have an important dependence with energy. And lower energies and um, uh, higher energies, we have a change of the Bragg angle. And as we have seen before, uh, the time delay and the uh, transverse displays a position is related to the Bragg angle somehow. So when we have a higher energies, the echoes are much more spread around because they can travel in longer path in the crystal. And when we are um, at higher energies, they are much more uh, smaller. So it's something to take into account when you also want to do experiments. Um, if we look to the time signal, actually, uh, we see that the gold, uh, so for the 100 nanometers, we will have like, here I have changed the simulation, I have yeah, simulated one femtosecond. This is important to say, it's not 10 femtoseconds, but yes, one, because this is it's easy to explain. Uh, so here we have just one femtosecond and we see how uh, we have in 100 microns just the one femtosecond that we introduced. But actually, if we go to the 500 nanometers, we already see that we have win a few hundreds of attoseconds uh, that will be located in uh, our uh, signal. Uh, if we go to one micron, uh, we almost win uh, two uh, to extend it to two femtoseconds. And when we are uh, talking about five microns or 10 uh, microns, we can see that it's like four or even seven uh, femtoseconds larger, the signal. Uh, but it's not just one femtosecond needed, no? Uh, we can see also the effect in the two femtoseconds, five femtoseconds, and 10 femtoseconds. And we always see that we have this extension for the 500, uh, so for the five microns, we always see these three extra femtoseconds to the signal. Uh, if we look to the uh, Bragg reflection or the Bragg geometry, we actually see that uh, something interesting that is that always our uh, intensity in the main uh, diffraction is going to be of the same intensity. But actually, we are going to have also some kind of, uh, sorry, uh, of peaks uh, or echoes that are going to appear. And these are related to the uh, back or rear surface in really thin crystal. And the echoes are even appearing in the dynamical case of the Bragg geometry, even up to 250 nanometers. So extremely thin crystals. Much more easy to observe when uh, we are looking to the forward direction, where we clearly see the echoes appearing in the uh, really thin crystal and uh, also in the rest, no? And we see how when we are in the forward, gold is absorbing a lot. So of course, our peak is going to decrease uh, uh, drastically. Uh, as we said in Spanish, it's not gold, everything that signs. Uh, this also may happen in nickel, gallium arsenide, and indium antimonide, as was uh, observed or uh, uh, Mariana is also presenting. So this is actually quite uh, interesting, no? How we are living in this world where we are starting to uh, to see the effects of dynamical diffraction in our sources and the high impact that this can have in our temporal resolution in the femtosecond world. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators along this path uh, and uh, uh, also like uh, Anders Madsen that he has supported me uh, to uh, continue doing this research while I am at MID uh, and all the instruments I have worked at. And especially I would like to thank Ken Finkelstein. That was my uh, introduce, the person that introduced me to dynamical diffraction and who, who retired uh, just uh, one year ago. Uh, and yeah, all the members of uh, Max4, uh, Stenek, uh, Gerardina, uh, Alexander, uh, and uh, also uh, the person that support me uh, during all these years, uh, Marian Levy. Uh, and remember, uh, this guy is not a diffraction peak. So uh, with that, uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Angel. That was really nice, enthusiastic presentation uh, and a quite a, a large overview. I think that the most, uh, the most interesting uh, uh, message from this is that actually dynamical effects really appear in very, very small samples. And actually, a few studies had already highlighted this. Uh, actually, I think that uh, Alexander, who is in the audience, was one uh, part of one of the recent studies. Uh, so the session is open for comments, for uh, criticisms, for questions. I see already Alexander says, um, Bouchou have shown that the pulse broadening effects due to dynamical effects 15 years ago this is why the reason why the beam splitter was not introduced in an expel. 
So what's new in your study? That's it. My answer is that we have the pin splitters in, uh, in uh, Excel or in European Excel. Actually, um, we are using it in the splitting delay line of uh, MID. Uh, it's important uh, to say that also, this is also what we use bent crystals for the spectrometers, really thin ones. And yeah, what is uh, new in the study? That is a really good question. But maybe it's just the observation of the real effect and not just a theoretical work as Busweb did. So I think that is the experimental view that anyone was able to saw until now. Yeah, also with a, with a very uh, high resolution in this case. Anna. So I, I will have to leave the very soon, actually. I'm really sorry about that. And then I will try to follow you from the telephone while I am traveling. But I just wanted to make the point that the, uh, Angel is actually using all his knowledge on dynamic uh, diffraction, dynamical diffraction calculations in order to try to simulate uh, exactly also the, um, the how these waves uh, propagate in, in the case of the pillars, for example. And uh, taking into account all these uh, echoes, well, these are just the effects that happen, and putting them together, he's starting to get uh, yeah, quite an insight into what may be happening in the experiment, which could be something nice to follow up. So I just wanted to comment on that. Okay, thank you, Anna. And thank you for, for your presence today. Uh, Vaslav. Uh, this is ju just my ignorance and uh, my uh, curiosity. How did you simulate it? So did you use simple or standard Takahit open equations? Or in case of short pulses, you have to add time as a, as a variable. How do you do it? No, I, actually, we are not uh, uh, introducing the, uh, so, so, so what, what, this is part also of the collaboration that I have with the SRW uh, people. No, so what you usually do is just you simulate uh, out of time and you just uh, bring uh, the different slice of the beam on time. Uh -huh. Okay. So it's, uh, it, that is how also it's done in SRW. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Other questions or comments? I have one. Hi, Stenek. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, at the end, it was a little bit too fast for me. So you mentioned that you did some simulation with one femtosecond. Yeah. Then I saw some 10 femtoseconds. Uh, so what will be the difference at the end? No. So, so the difference is known, as is presented here. Uh, yeah. The, the uh, broadening of the signal is still the same. No? So, yeah. so you can see that here we have one femtosecond, and then we have all the broadening of this signal. And here we have uh, the uh, 10 femtoseconds and the broadening of this signal. Yeah. So, so okay. Uh -huh. So it's always the same broadening at the end. And, and it's important. Yeah, okay, in another direction. Yeah, yeah okay. The, now this size. Yeah. No, because it's always having this butterfly, like in the uh, transverse direction. Okay, Vaslav, raise your hand, please. Uh, yeah, this is again my, my, my ignorance. If you calculate the, the, the length of the wave packet for one, uh, uh, the, the length of the wave packet for one femtosecond, something like, I don't know, 300 nanometers or something. This is much smaller, much shorter than the extinction length. So how do you speak about dynamical theory in this case? Uh, the length of the wave packet is, is some nanometers, not 100 nanometers, 300 nanometers. This is much shorter than the extinction length. And the extinction length is the critical value for distinguishing between dynamical and kinematic theory. So if, if the sample is shorter than the extinction, smaller than the extinction length, which is in your case, effectively, then yeah. everything happens kinematically, or I'm not right. Uh, I'm not sure about but that. But this is not my, this is my ignorance, probably. So, so actually, this uh, is extremely uh, good and important question, no? Because maybe the extinction length is not what defines fully the dynamical diffraction. Maybe we were thinking like that until now because we can look really in the time domain or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. 
be that, uh, as you see, if we have really big pulses, like what we can have, 150 picoseconds, we're not going to see this effect at all. Only when we have thick crystal, thicker crystals that are of the rate of the extinction length, may we see it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. even if it's smaller. Mm -hmm. I think that this is possibly something a bit more intrinsic, fast love, in the sense that at the end, interferences with, with, with the, the photons with themselves, isn't it? And, and the beam still propagates through. I'm not specialist in this field, so I don't know. So, Alexander. Alexander will know it. Will well, know I'll, I'll just comment here, Vaslav. I think it's uh, actually uh, for statical, actually all this uh, extension length is what is uh, commonly used and what is easy mm -hmm. to use, right? But we still have effects even under those yes. sickness as yeah. actually yeah. shown okay. here and we saw yeah. it before. And yeah. here we are yeah. talking about really dynamical effects in sense of time uh, constraints. So here uh, Dina is also right completely. So this is more complicated. Here. And uh, both Victor Kohn and Bouchou have calculated mm -hmm. those effects for mm -hmm. uh, decades already. So yeah. Felix Chukowski did some. Also, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. you know, a lot of people, yeah. those people. Yeah. But actually I had yeah. another comment about the simulations. So uh, you have shown that you have some Takagi Topen simulations for those kind of uh, situations. There was a paper by Anatoly Shabalin who made a program for simulating Together with strain, there is no complication to add strain if you have agreed in your Takagi to pen equations. So there, are, there, is, there was a paper published, and I think code is also available. So if you are interested, you can search for it. Yeah, it I was know. like five years ago. Yeah, no, but, but there is also, also all the work done with a PhD from my instrument, this Kolilia Petrov, no? That I don't know. I don't know him or her. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, him, uh, Ilya. Uh, yeah. He is uh, actually quite uh, the boat, and he's a master student from Busuet. So I have quite a big contact with uh, this group, with Busuet, Liuba, and all this. Uh, uh, group. And we are actually really interested in it, no? And he has presented Ilya many uh, works uh, where he's actually also like integrating and using. Uh, who was sorry the, the person that you were? Uh, Anatoly Shabalin. He is now back. Uh, he was in Ivan Vartanya's group, and now he's back uh, in Daisy. Basically, he was the one who actually did all the yeah, programming. He, he's also talking about the uh, fluorescence yeah, at the moment. He's doing with uh, Nina, no? Or what? I, what I just mean is that there are uh, there is a program and there there was a paper about it and also strain is not a problem for those calculations. So if you are interested, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's it. Yeah, I, I have talked with him a couple of times. Uh, I have a I have a general comment. Um, uh, I mean the 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 main different one of the main differences between the previous the work presented by Mariana and the work presented by Angel is that in, in the case of Mariana, it's, it's really imaging. So uh, that's uh, the whole, the setup is the same in, and the technique is the same. Uh, but uh, uh, in one case, there is a large beam that illuminates the whole sample. So it's a real topography type of measurement. So the final aim is really to uh, get a high resolution image of the strain and understanding of the strain. Um, in this case, we are actually measuring, Hanghel is actually measuring a pure diffraction effect. So we are not measuring the near field of, um, uh, of, of uh, interaction uh, between X-rays and matters. We are, we are effectively measuring a far field, a full diffraction. So there's no way to propagate back and get the information of the sample, but it's just a pure diffraction. So I have a question that comes back to also to uh, what Virginie and Ross and Anna was talking before. Do we really need a coherent beam in entrance to apply the tychography, the principle of coherent? I mean, diffraction is intrinsically a coherent effect. We know that all this through highly ordered crystals, only a, full, only a small part, which is actually of the photons in, in phase, and they are propagated multiple times inside the inside the, the crystals. So actually we're thinking with Angel, do we really need a coherent beam to start with? Would it just not work even without a coherent beam? Open for... 
I'd say you mix mix up transverse and temporal coherence. So for any diffraction, you need temporal coherence, right? Mm -hmm. But then if you want to reconstruct like shape or well size, later, let, lateral uh, information about your object, you still need transfer co coherence. But 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 in this, I mean, we are coming in with a nano beam, right? So that's like a hundred by hundred nanometer beam, and the diffracted field is actually produced by a temporal effect, and is extended over many microns, 20, 30 microns. That that was my question. If you actually refer to the diagram which was shown before, like uh, incident beam diffracted beam and the pass difference, that's not really applicable to dynamical effect because again, extinction length, as was of mentioned it doesn't matter that you have 20 microns. If your extinction length is half a micron, you don't care about everything else in depth, right? Your beam is not going there. You don't have this signal. No, I'm talking about the, the lateral extension of the, of the signal in the plane of diffraction. So in the perpendicular. Ah, in perpendicular. Echoes is, is like, you know, the, the, actually the, the, the plot that is here now shown um, yeah, maybe, uh, may, I, may I have a comment? I think in this case, what matters is the size of the green function. No? You have this green Riemann function from the, the, from the standard dynamical theory, you know, from, from Otier and this stuff. And the size of the, the, of the size, the uh, spatial size of this, of this Riemann function, which determines, in fact, the size of the Bormann fan, in, in, in diffracted beam, in break, reflect, break, break geometry, this is what can be com should be compared to the, to the coherent, coherent bits. Okay, okay. So I would say uh, if your coherent bits is larger than the size of the, of the Bormann fan, then you can treat the, the incoming beam as locally coherent. But everything, what the multiple scattering events occur in the Bormann fan. So then if the Bormann fan is coherently irradiated, then the multiple scattering can take place. Otherwise, if, if the coherent width is shorter than the Bormann fan, then, then of course the, the multiple scattering doesn't, cannot appear fully in this, Borm, in this volume. So what, what matters is the size of the Bormann fan. Which is, which is dependent on the chi of the polarizability of the wavelength and on the geometry. Okay, thank you. And another question I had about the, um, the dynamical effect showing up with a large beam, um, they will superimpose each other. Uh, you know, we are capable of um, looking at these echoes and very well because we have a high resolution, we have a very small beam. So mm -hmm. we claim that with a larger beam, we would not be able to see it. But in the case of uh, the topography experiment, that's a large beam and we, and we still see dynamical effect. Of so, course, because in this, uh, sorry. In yes, this case, the beam is large. So all these echoes superimpose hmm? because yes. in, Ideal case, the, the, the incoming beam is infinitely large in, in cross direction. So all these echoes superimpose and what you see is the interference of these plane waves. They are plane waves. No? So there is no lateral resolution. There is no distribution of intensity in lateral direction. The intensity in lateral direction is constant. Okay. But you see, still do see the dynamical effect because of this interference of these echoes, but you cannot separate the echoes in a real space. Yes, yes, I see. No? So other questions or comments? This session has been a little bit long and heavy, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs>